So, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, the breath of life. So, uh, as we dive into chapter 2, we need to make sure that we understand uh, that, that it's not a co contradiction to chapter 1. It is kind of a, a, an assertive summary that God's going to do as the author going in a little bit deeper on creation as he talks about the creation of man. And he talks about the end, that like it's done, it's finished. And, and so we'll, we'll see that as it's, it's a reminder that we can trust uh, what we've read in chapter 1. It's not a contradiction of what we've read in chapter 1. It's, it's, like I said, it's just a more uh, summarized view of creation. So, so far we've had day 1, which, was sun, you know, which is the, the light created and divided from darkness. And then day two, we had the atmosphere created and divided from the oceans. And day three, uh, the land created and divided from water and vegetation. And then on, Wednesday, uh, on day four, it was the sun, moon, and the stars created to fill the sky. Day five was the creatures created to fill the sky and the water. Uh, and then day six, uh, cre uh, the creatures created to fill the land and man created as a as a pinnacle of creation and then on day seven eventually what we'll see is him resting and so as we get into chapter uh chapter two that's what we need to as we're stepping into it and so what we got is in that first verse it says thus uh the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them so one of the things that we need to understand is that the the whole bible points to jesus it's, it's very important to get that. It, it's like to understand that John tells us at the very beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Anything made that was made. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For everything was created by Him, in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So Jesus is that creation. I just want to make sure you all get that. And, and at some point, we won't need the light. The sun and the moon. It's funny, as we went up this morning, we got there before the sunrise. Uh, sunrise and just to see the beauty of God's creation. As you stare out, and, and that's the one thing about Texas is the skies. Is it still doing it, Court? Okay. Uh, I, I get worried when I see you <laughs> with the headphones. I'm like, oh, we, if we got to fix it, we'll fix it. But uh, I appreciate it. It's, uh, you know, we, we see the sun and the moon have been there. Uh, the stars have dissipated and start falling away. Creation, animals have passed, and plants go away. And uh, one of the things that we need to remember is that the light, we won't need it anymore at some point. In Revelation 22, 5, it says, And night will be no more, and they will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the, the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And so when you think about creation, you're thinking about it at that very beginning. You had light created, divided from darkness. You had atmosphere created, and divided from oceans. Land created, divided with water and vegetation. But it wasn't until day four that the sun showed up and the moon. And so God was the light. And God will be the light. And we won't need light. And also Jesus, we, we won't need light in heaven. We won't need the sun. The lamp or the sun. For the Lord God will be their, their light and they will reign forever and ever. And so it's, it's just one of those things that we need to remember as, as we look at this and just the power of God speaking. And God could have been done with this just by that first word spoken. Like the whole creation could have been done. But he did it in seven days. And there's a reason for that. Uh, we'll get into that and and I love what he says thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them The heavens and the earth were what finished And and second Peter chapter 3 verse 5 through 7 says for they deliberately overlooked the fact that heavens existed long ago 
and the earth was formed out of it of, out of water and through water by the word of God. And that they, by, by means of these worlds that uh, then existed with, was deluged with water and perished. But the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So Peter's summarizing saying that the, the same God who created the world by his word will also be the same God who intervenes and, and does whatever he wants and wishes to do because why? He's God. He's God. He stands outside of time. He's, he's all-powerful. He's just. Um, you know, and, and so it's a reminder to us that, that, um, that when he says something is finished, it's finished. Because evolutionists will say that it just continues. It just continues to happen. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's by faith that we understand. It's by faith that we go, and, and it's funny because we shared that video with you about the Hubble st the, the telescope as it goes out. And it's proven, proven that as God speaks, that's how a universe expanded. That's how it happened. And, and it's visible, but we take it by faith, but we're starting to see evidence of it too now. Um, and, and it's important for us to understand it, but we have to also understand, like, I cannot take a human witness of evolution when it's just a theory. When I can take the author, God, the creator, who's given us what happened. He's telling us what happened. He's telling it to, to Moses. Hey, this is what happened. This is how I created the sun and the moon. This, I mean, he's going through everything. And so we take that by faith. In Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word, the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. And so when he says, And heavens and earth are finished, on the seventh day God finished in his, his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. It doesn't say that there was any other incident or thing that needed to continue. It was finished. So it doesn't mean that there's a blob of something that becomes something else. No, it's finished. There's nothing else that needs to be done. You have to remember that God stands outside of space, time, matter, and energy. Okay? He's, he's outside of space and time and matter and energy. He created something out of nothing. Something out of nothing. And, and it's funny because as we look at the heavens and the earth, if we look at the expanse, we look at the, the stars and the moon, and the sun, it's been worshipped by false gods for many years. For many years. And the Lord warned us about that. He said not to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. But people do it, still to this day. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. And we know that Baal and Asherah actually were part of the ones who worshipped the sun god and the storm god. And they ended up being a major problem for the Israelites because they drew the Israelites into that worship. And then they worshipped the, the ancient Phoenicians. The Canaanites worshipped the, the moon goddess, Asherah. And there's a principal female deity worshipped by the, by the Syrians, the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. And the Israelites were drawn into it because they started worshipping it as well. And it wasn't until the... As they neglected the Lord that, that God finally sent help to them in, in Egypt eventually. But they, they, he told them not to, not to mess with that stuff. And they did. 
And eventually the kings of Judah and the bones of the princes who worshipped the, the host of heaven pagan gods would be removed from their graves and exposed to the sun and the moon. In Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 2 it says, And they shall be spread before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and served, which they have gone after, in which they have sought and worshipped, and they shall not be gathered or buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. Dung. Dumped out of their graves. Exposed. Because why? They worship the sun. They worship the, the, the moon and the, and, uh, and the sun. And these were, these were princes and kings of Judah. And so there, there's a, 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 a something for us to remember is as we look at these things, we need to understand that God will judge. You may think you're getting away with something right now, but eventually he's long-suffering. But at some point, he's going to judge. These men were gone from the earth, and yet they turned their graves over. And it was to let the other people know, look, these are not things you're supposed to be worshiping. And we have a lot of people worshiping a lot of false gods today. But God is the only one who can create something out of nothing. Remember, it is God that stands outside of space and time. He creates time, space, matter, and energy. God did it. He did it during creation. He created in the universe the laws of physics. All matter was, as we know it, the periodic elements and all the stars, all the planets... The earth and all of its unique functions of, of, of how we have all these other planets. And this is the only one that has life. That's it. They'll keep searching. But they won't find it as unique as this. As, they, as we have animals and humans. And yet. With this beautiful creation. Because of sin. God will flood. The earth. Because of what they were doing in sin. He'll deal with it. And again, why do we ask that question? We can say, well, God, why did you do that, right? What is the, what's the answer? He's God and you're not. He's just and he's, he, he, he doesn't change. Right? He's the same today, tomorrow, and forever. So he's not going to go, oh, you know what? I feel sorry for you. I'm, uh, we'll let that go. That's not how that works. It's not how that works. I mean, just we were just talking about that before we started service tonight. And just think about how, how the Lord, a, at the end of the day, has wiped out nations or have, has done these different things. And you go, man, why? Because they were disobedient. And he had been long-suffering. He had given them chance after chance after chance after chance. And they, they would not turn. They would kill the prophets. They killed the judges. Right? Or they would have a judge come and, and they would be like, okay, now we're going to turn. And they would go right back to worshiping false gods. And so when we, we see things like Sodom and Gomorrah, we see uh, the, the, the global flood. And you go, man, that's it's crazy. But thank God you live in the, the era of grace. Right? Think about how many animals you would have to sacrifice for your sin every day. Every week. It's a lot. But I love what he said, and on, and, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. That he had done. Nobody else is doing it. It's done. It's finished. It's finished. And the Hebrew word for finished, it means to be ceased, to be fulfilled, to be complete. It needs nothing else. Do you all understand that? It, there's nothing else that needs to be done. 
And so what they'll say is that, oh, the, the, the expanse of the universe is still growing. It's still, it's, whatever God spoke, it's done. There's nothing else that needs to be done. And, and so that, that really, for an evolutionist, that, that, that creates a problem. Because they believe in the Big Bang that there are forces that are still at work today. And so there are two very different opinions when you look at the worldview. And then when, you, we, when we look at the accuracy of God's Word, it says it's finished. And that's what theis, theistic evolution is. They refute that, that it's Holy Spirit inspired, that God spoke creation and existed. And, and they, they, don't, they just don't believe it. They believe that it's still going that it's still happening that we'll still have new species and we'll have all these and that's not true you have kinds and we don't get new species right it's like we talked about last week you don't have a dog turning into an elephant that's not going to happen okay but it's finished and it reminded me as I read that it's finished. It's the same thing that Jesus, as he takes his last breath on the cross, it's finished. There's nothing else that needs to be done for you to be able to be forgiven for your sin. It's finished. You can't earn it, right? You, you, you just have to repent. You have to admit that you're a sinner and ask Christ into your heart and turn from your sin. Because it's finished. And it says he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. I don't know why I like that, that phrase, all the work that he had done. Nobody else did it. <laughs> it was all God. Okay? It's all God. When we look at creation, it's all God. When you see the beautiful sky in Texas when it's painted and that lavender and pink and it, it, you just see it across, it's, that's all God. And just think, that's tainted. It's tainted. He created it, he made it, he formed it, and it's finished. But now he rests. Does the Lord get tired? No. Isaiah forty twenty eight says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, his understanding is unsearchable. That's Isaiah forty twenty eight. We know in, it, it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. And we talk about the Sabbath here. The Sabbath day made holy. And it says, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because it was, because on God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God blesses it and he sets it apart. He sanctifies it. It's set apart. It's holy. It's a day of rest. And again, it's a reminder that God doesn't get tired. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He never tires. God rested on the seventh day. He simply he stopped what he was doing. He ceased from his labor. And this is important for us to understand as we talk about the Sabbath rest. We've kind of gone into this before. And, and as we talk about the Sabbath, a lot of people will say that you have to practice the Sabbath as a Christian. Are you practicing the Sabbath? And I'll give you some scripture that shows that no. I mean, you need to rest and we'll talk about that. But we know with the Sabbath it was given in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. It says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, we know that what happens is with the Sabbath is the rabbis come and they start making traditions of men. They start writing what you can do for the Sabbath. Like, can you crack an egg on the Sabbath? No one can't crack an egg on the Sabbath. Can I, I can't tie my horse up on the Sabbath or my donkey on the Sabbath. I can't do none of that stuff. They had all these long traditions of laws that people couldn't keep. 
And again, they were traditions because when Jesus speaks, Jesus tells them, he tells them it is written. He keeps going back into Scripture trying to explain it to them. Those were traditions of men. In Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, it says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus was telling them, Hey, look, the Sabbath rest, the law that y'all came up, I am the Sabbath. I am the Sabbath. Now, are you required to keep the Sabbath? In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard uh, to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to who? Christ. To Christ. And then again in Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 and 11, it says, But not that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and the worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want, want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid I, have, I may have labored over you in vain. He's like, he's telling them, like, those things, they're not what you practice anymore. Jesus is the Sabbath. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 11, it says, So then, there remains the Sabbath rest for the people of God. Whoever has entered God's rest, which means salvation, you've given your life over to Christ, you have God's rest, has also rested from His works that God did from, uh, from His. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the, the same sort of disobedience. So we're not, we're not required to keep the Sabbath. But can your body work seven days a week? You can't. Your body will shut down. You will have heart issues. You will have digestive issues. You may have anxiety, depression. All of that stuff because you're working yourself. Because God never intended you to work that way. Right? I, I'm always one to tell you, you need to take rest. And I know I need it right now, too, because I can feel it. I've been, I've been, for the last two weeks, I'm like, I got to go to the beach. So as soon as we get done with the Winterstrom event, I'm off. I'm taking off to the beach. I have to. Because I'm already past the point of needing rest. And I know that. But we need, to, we need to honor what God has done and we need to also just take time to rest to be at His feet. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, it says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed Him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to His teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her, her, tell her then to help me. I always find it funny that she's telling Jesus what to do. Lord, she needs to do this. And I think we do that with people too. Right? We can do that and we need to be careful. Because that's God's job. The Holy Spirit will put it on their heart. You need to be praying for them. You need to be praying. You know, it's like at the end of the day, it's like you need to be praying for them. Don't be trying to tell the Lord what, Lord, you need to do this with them. I'm like, no, God's trying to do something with you. He's trying to tell you, you need to choose a good portion and be at the feet. You're not listening. But you're over here trying to tell her or tell him what to do, and that's, that needs to stop. You need to be focused on the person in the mirror. But the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Do you understand when you work yourself to death, you're working seven days a week, you're not taking any time off, you will be anxious and troubled about many things. You will not be able to rest at night. You will be up tossing and turning. Waking up at 4.30 in the morning. 
worried about stuff. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen a good portion which will not be taken away from her. She had chosen to be at the feet of Jesus. And that's what we need to do. When we talk about rest, rest is not you going on a vacation to where you have all these itinerary things planned out. And your, your vacation is more stressful than your time at home. God bless my mother, but that's how my mother was. We're going to do this at 9 o'clock. We're going to do this. And I was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. I just want to kind of chill. You know? And when I go to the beach, I don't have any schedule. Don't want one. Don't need one. What time I get up, that's when I go eat breakfast. You know, we don't put... Like we can even t on vacation, on our days of rest, we can make it so hard and, and be so stressed out and you take that on vacation with you. You don't need to do that. You know what? If you want to sleep in until 9, 30, 10 o'clock, go for it. Because guess what? There will be a place somewhere in Corpus that still serves breakfast at 11.30. There, there is, I can tell you that. But you need, to, you need to understand that when you take rest, a lot of times when you do that, that's when you hear from the Lord. And sometimes when you're taking rest, God is using that rest to strengthen you for something that's coming. Preparing you for something that's down the line that you're not even ready for. So yeah, we need to be careful because yes, workaholics, be careful. You'll be dead by, your six, by the time you turn 60 years old. You'll have a heart attack. You'll be a, gone. You need to slow down. You need to slow down. I, I Look, you're working six days a week according to God's <laughs> schedule here. You can't take one day off, really? Really? And most of us are on a five-day work week, you know, for, for most people, but not people with farms and businesses, small businesses that are working a lot, a lot of hours. But usually that sixth day is to do the honeydew list, right? To, to catch up on things around the house that need to be done. But you need to take rest. Jeremiah 6.16 says this, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. You want to know why nations turn? This is why. You want to know why nations were judged? That's why. God sends Jeremiah. And the Lord says, <laughs> Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient past where the good way is. And walk in it and find rest for your souls. And they go, No, nope, we're going to keep doing this other thing. We're not walking in that. And you want to know why your life is in chaos. Or why God comes in and goes, okay, well, we gotta, we got to deal with this. And he does. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. Y'all know this one very well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He, make, he leads me beside still water. So not only is he going to make you lie down, he's going to lead you beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then finally in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The thing is, is we have to remember throughout the book of Mark, we've seen where Jesus has taken time to take rest. Right? Throughout the book of Mark, we've seen that. And it's important for us to remember that Jesus completed his ministry in three years. There was nothing else he needed to do. And yet he took rest. And so why can't you? The other thing is, is when people say they don't believe in the Bible, you know that every culture believes in a seven-day work week or a seven-day week. 
So they may not believe in the Bible, but they believe in a seven-day work week or a seven-day week that God created. So guess what? They believe in the Bible. We find rest. And we need to remember that. But we also find rest, and then God has plans for His followers. That's why He tells you in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And now we get into verse 4 where it says, The generations of heavens and the earth were, when they were created in the day uh, that the Lord... God made in heaven and, and earth and, and, and the heavens. And so now we get into the genealogy of the heavens and the earth. And so we're, we're given the history by God and it's recorded by man. Um, and this section is, is uh, some people will say, well, this is a contradictory, uh, is contradictory to what the other verses was. And it's not. This is just going a little bit deeper and giving us more information from what chapter one gave us. It's important for us to understand that. We see in here that the heaven and the earth and then Adam and then vegetation and animals and then Eve. But we, what we're doing is we're kind of backtracking to the last, uh, last event of creation on the sixth day of creation of man. And this is the first section of the narrative that actually begins the, the talk of Adam. And we'll get into Adam and Eve next week. Um, and we'll deal with that. And there's a whole lot of stuff we got to get into that. But th- this is the end of, of a generation, the history of, of creation. As he talks about the, the, these are generations, these are histories of the heavens and the earth when they were created. They have, it's already been created. It's done. Remember he said it's finished. Right? It's finished. And so whatever God did uniquely uh, done through creation, uh, done on creation week, those things are, are coming and being revealed as what, what happened already. And so when we look at it, we look at it through the lens of Scripture. And this is the first time as we look at verse 4, uh, we see the Lord God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the existing one, the Lord provider of mankind. And, and God is presented to, to us under the name of Elohim, the Creator. And when man appears, God appears with the title of Jehovah or Yahweh, the covenant maker, the promise keeper. And, and, and you're going to see that, that word dominate chapter 2. Throughout chapter 2. And it says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And so we see that there was a responsibility that the man was going to have. So man was always had a, had a purpose. Adam the farmer, actually, and, and naming the animals. And, and, and yet, you know, as we, we look at the, the world today, we see work as a curse, right? After the fall. But it was always intended for man to work. So when you get to heaven, don't think that you're just going to be laying on a cloud eating chocolate or whatever you think that that is. (laughs) Right? I just think we, we forget that God had created. There was work always created for man. And it was something that was supposed to be beautiful. But we don't look at it that way, do we? We complain about it. We get upset about it. I mean, God's not only giving you work, but He's also giving you something to bring home every month to take care of your family. And you're complaining, right? The curse. I'm look. I'm. I'm. I can sit here and talk this. I don't want y'all to think that Mike don't. When I used to work, I man, I was a complainer. Especially before Christ. But I read this and I, I, one of the things that just reminded me is how blessed are you to be able to work? And there are people that can't. And 
God won't send rain until the, the global flood. When Noah has to tell everybody, hey, it's going to rain, and they're looking at him like, you've lost your mind, dude. Right? Verse 6, it says, And the mist was going up from the land, and was, was a watering hole the whole face of the ground. And we know Job 36, 27 says, For he draws up drops of water, they distill in the mist of the rain. So the mist should be translated as they flow. It indicates that the water came from beneath the ground as springs and spread over the whole earth in cycles of water. And then verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature from the dirt. The same soil that Adam's going to tend to, Adam came from. Made from dirt. And it's, and it's a, a view of day six of creation where he creates man. And I love because one of the things that talks about that word form actually is the same word that it means to a potter to fashion or make. A potter. And, and I think of Isaiah 64, 8. It says, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are a potter. And we all are work of your hand. We're all formed by God. And the man of dust from the, the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Formed from the dust. But yet, the breath of life actually in Hebrew means the soul of life. We're set apart from the animals. We are, are, are living beings. We, are, we were to have dominion over the animals, but we blew that. So who has dominion? I was watching a great, old, it's probably old, but it was called the Superbook. And it's the stories of the Bible. And then they were doing Genesis and it's, they were showing Lucifer when Lucifer gets cast down. And both my grandkids were like, he's bad. I said, oh yeah, he's bad, very bad. And I was like, I was, I was so excited that they showed him being cast down. And, and um, one of the things that I love is that, that at the end of the day, it's like we, we forget that we were, we were set apart. We we're a new creation in Christ as we give our lives to the Lord. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and we're, we're giving that, that breath of life uh, as we're born. You think about the first breath when a child is born is worshiping God. But your breath, as you inhale and exhale, you're made in His image and you're worshiping who? You don't even have to be a follower of God. Because you're breathing... That's what Yahweh means. That's what the word, and as you look at that, as the scholars looked at that word, it actually means, um, they concluded that the breath was the very name of God. Our breath is the confession of His, of His almighty power. That we're created by Him. That's what Yahweh meant. It didn't have the, the, the it wasn't spelt the same way. It was W-H-V-H in the Hebrew. Which actually means, the, the, the word means to breathe in, breathe out. Every time it's, it's the, the same sound you make as you inhale and you exhale. And you think about that as you talk about the, the breath of life, the Lord God who, who breathed life in, into every one of us. And it's the same last breath that Jesus had on the cross as he said it's finished. My wife's not here. She hadn't been here. She's been sick. And, and I, I hate coming to church without my wife. I, I just do. I miss her dearly. 
Um, and when I was studying this, and I was studying that word Yahweh, if you've ever seen somebody take their last breath on earth as they gasp, they're worshiping God and going to be with Him, hopefully, right? But to, to the, the thing I remembered as I read this is I was just thinking, you know, my father-in-law, when my father-in-law passed and, and just that last gasp of air and that exhale. And then that was it. And born into heaven, right? Hopefully, you, you've given your life to Christ, born into heaven. And, and I just, I, 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 our breath is something we take advantage of from the time we get up to the time we go to bed, right? We don't even think about it. But every time you're inhaling and exhaling, that's because of God. That's because of God. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're filled with with the, the Holy Spirit that helps us, guides us, directs us to, to be a new creation in Christ, to be a servant of God. And to think that He breathed into Adam. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. In Psalm 103, it says, Now that the Lord, He is God, it is He who made us. And we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pastor. God has given man the ability to serve, to have fellowship, to have that spiritual being, to have that spiritual connection with Him, to worship Him. God has given us that. But you know what else God gave us? Free will. And that gets a lot of people in trouble. We have free will to either worship God or not. You have free will to either reject God, reject God or, or to follow God. You have free will. But you also have the capacity to serve and be in fellowship with God. It's a choice. A choice that every human gets to make. You know, you think about it, you just think about your life. Think about by the time you're six or seven, you start knowing what is right and what's wrong. And you know you're doing wrong. And yet we have free will. And, and it's amazing. You know, I think some of the greatest testimonies are people who just grew up in the faith. And you would say, oh, no, no, it's got to be the one that was a coke addict. and that. No. What a testimony for somebody to... That's why I love Daniel. When I read the book of Daniel, I'm, I'm encouraged by Daniel because I see somebody who lived a life from the time he was, uh, that we come onto the scene when he's a teenager worshiping God and still worshiping God as he goes home. Man of prayer. Faithful. Praying for his nation. Created by God. We're all made out of the dust. We all have had life breathed into us. We have a master designer. I think when you even when you study the body, and we'll get into some of that next week. Well, yeah, next week. We'll get into some of that as we study uh, just the uniqueness of God's creation, our, our, our bodies. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I think the thing that we need to remember is, is as God breathed in life to Adam... The last Adam actually took his last breath on this earth on the cross. Jesus. 
And next week we're going to shift because we're going to get into uh, Adam and Eve and we're going to talk about marriage. Uh, we'll talk about the human body and just the uniqueness of it. Uh, God's creation. But y'all need to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, it's finished. God's creation's Nothing else needs to be added. Oh, he don't need to. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't. I should have put another planet. Let me put another planet. That's not how it works. <laughs> it says he's finished. He's done. Right? He's done. And, and so I, 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 I love when you just study these first seven verses. It's awesome, just to kind of see um, how how the word Yahweh shows up. And, and that he's our, our provider, our creator. That he wants worship with us. He wants fellowship with us. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through. He, he uh, you know, my daughter was sharing something with me th th today that uh, about Jeffrey Dahmer coming to no faith. And see, some of y'all turn your heads already, right? But see, God can save anybody. Right? God can save anybody. That's our God. Like that God would, like we look at it and go, man, dude, that guy's nuts. But God saved him. Son of Sam. God saved him. God, at the end of the day, look at Paul. He was a murderer. He had people murdered and put in jail. But yet God saved him. So, you know, we need to remember, like, at the end of the day, God, God wants fellowship with all of us. And God, man, like, any time that you think God's not near me, just breathe. Get quiet and just say, Lord, let me, let me just breathe and be with you. Because every time you inhale and every time you're exhaling, it's Yahweh. Yahweh. And he's with you. And you need to remember that because you're going to go through things in life and there's going to be times where you just struggle and you're struggling to breathe. And you just need to stop and ask the Lord to help you.